Hello and welcome to this masterclass, which is part of the annual Just Like Us School Diversity Week, a nationwide week-long event where thousands of primary and secondary schools and colleges come together to talk and learn about LGBT plus identities, to celebrate diversity and to make our schools and communities more safe, inclusive and happy places for LGBT plus students, LGBT plus families and our allies. Before we start, it's really important that we all stay safe online this week and beyond. So we've posted some information on online safety in the comments of this video. Today's masterclass is an interfaith panel, and we are so lucky to have four brilliant experts here with us today to share their knowledge, experience, and insights on what it's like being a person of faith and LGBT+. We have Ruby Almeida, a Catholic LGBT rights plus and uh, LGBT plus rights campaigner, sorry, and lecturer who, among plenty of other incredible achievements, set up the first Catholic LGBT plus group in India, Rainbow Catholics India, in 2018. We also have Rabbi Anna Posner, who was ordained last year and is now the Progressive Judaism Student Chaplain and Rabbi for BKY and Norwich Liberal Community. She's been featured in media outlets like the BBC, Jewish News UK, and by JW. We have Dr. Ludovic Mohammed Zahid, who is an imam and researcher who, among other really amazing things, founded Europe's first ever inclusive mosque in Paris, France, which accommodates LGBT plus Muslims and their allies. Last but certainly not least, we have the brilliant canon Rachel Mann, an Anglican priest, poet, philosopher and feminist theologian, currently a visiting fellow at Manchester Writing School. To start us off, I'm delighted to hand you over to our guests who are going to introduce themselves to you in a bit more detail. And after that, we'll turn to today's panel discussion. Ruby, would you like to start us off? Uh, this so, I mean, it's such an important occasion, isn't it? Diversity Week. There's opportunities to connect with students. I mean, my background is, is in education, but mainly in media. I worked in the industry for a long time. Sort of fell into education, fell in love with it, and was able to impart my love for media. Uh, you know, and and so the opportunity, whenever I get it, to engage with students uh, to talk about LGBT issues, which is this other big part of my life, massively important. So just just to say that yes, media uh, and education has been a huge part of my life, but working with the LGBT community, particularly Catholic faith communities uh, in England has been massive in my life, having worked uh, very closely with uh, Quest, which is the pastoral support group for LGBT Catholics, and then going into the more kind of global scale of working at the global network of Rainbow Catholics uh, with uh, um, um, member groups all around the world. I mean, that's quite an incredible thing, you know, in all the different time zones, reconnecting with people, particularly, you know, lead up to um, Pride, uh, uh, Idaho at the moment. There's such a lot going on at the moment, same-sex blessings, you know, I mean, like every day is connecting with people around the world, uh, talking about their experience and, and just sharing this, this amazing thing that we do as people of faith, you know, irrespective of whether uh, you, you know, uh, what your sexuality is, if you have a faith, it's just this most amazing kind of landscape to be in. So to be here to share uh, and to connect is wonderful. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Ruby. Um, if we go over to Anna now, if you're ready. Thanks, Anna. Hi, yes, I'm Anna. I am... Um, as you said, there, I've got three hats. I'm the rabbi of two small communities and also the chaplain for progressive students all around the UK. I grew up in Nottingham um, in the liberal Jewish movement, which is where I'm a rabbi now. Um, and I feel very blessed to have grown up in the liberal Jewish movement where I never really needed to question my LGBTQ plus identity um, and my Jewish identity, um, certainly not in a religious con context. Um, my, the community I work for, BKY, one of the communities I work for, was set up 31 years ago by a group of radical feminist secular lesbians. Um, they wanted a space for, um, they wanted a community where they felt that they could belong. And 31 years ago, um, the general Jewish world, even though some movements may have been more welcoming, um, didn't feel like a safe and welcoming place. And so from there, Beit Kalal Yisrael which means a home for all of Israel, 
um, developed um, as a place for questioning theology and being a place for anybody who didn't feel like they belonged elsewhere to be. And we try and hold some of those original values as well. That's wonderful, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, Rachel, if you're ready to introduce yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Canon Rachel Mann, um, and, and Hannah's covered uh, so much of of what I'm about. Um, I'm uh, a priest in the Church of England. I've been ordained for 16 years, and I've spent certainly the past, gosh, nearly 13 years in a parish in South Manchester with other responsibilities running across South Manchester and uh, regionally and nationally. I'm a member of the Church of England's governing body, the General Synod, and of its Theological Advisory Board. I'm about to move jobs. I'm about to move to the north of the diocese to take responsibility for a, a huge chunk of um, of the, the north of the diocese, running from Prestwich right into uh, the Rottendale Hills as area dean of those areas. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, I'm also out and very proud about is that I'm a trans woman. I transitioned in my very early 20s. And gosh, I'm now getting very, very old. Um, I'm in my early 50s. And it has been an extraordinary journey and pilgrimage um, to uh, both be out as trans and, uh, dare I say it in this day and age, to be out as a Christian and out as a public, representat public representative of a faith. I came to faith after my transition. So that's been a really interesting part of my story. And I'm really passionate about inclusion and representation and participation and working with this established church of which I'm part to make sure that LGBTQIA plus people can flourish and be their full selves as who God has called them to be. Thank you so much, Rachel, and congratulations on your new job. Um, Ludovic, if you're ready to go ahead and introduce yourself, that would be amazing. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Salam alaikum. Peace be upon you, all of you. Thank you for this great event. I'm so happy to be able to be part of this uh, dynamic. So my name is Ludovic Mohammed Zahed. I was born in Algiers, 1977. Uh, where I studied uh, theology to become an imam, and then um, I moved to Paris and, and Marseille for 25 years now in Marseille, and Paris for my studies, uh, uh, PhD in, in anthropology and another one in psychology. Um, I founded the first inclusive mosque in Paris in 2012, um, and now there's uh, such communities, inclusive progressive Muslim communities, a bit everywhere in Western Europe, uh, in North America, of course, in South Africa, in Indonesia, the biggest Muslim country in the world, in, in the world, yes. Um, uh, and I'm currently director of the Kalem Institute in Marseille, where we do mainly uh, research, publications, and trainings uh, about intersectional. Um, um, topics like uh, crossing uh, uh, sexuality, gender expression, LGBT queer identities with faith background, et ethnical diversity, integration in the in a democratic republican dynamic in France, in Europe, uh, in North Africa. Also, we're working a lot with grassroots organizations there trying to help them to structure themselves, giving them as many logistical and, and intellectual tools to free themselves from prejudices and dogmatism and extremism, wherever it's coming from. So, yeah, thank you to, to, to invite me to be part of this. Thank you so much, Ludovic, and thank you to all four of you. It's so lovely to hear a bit more about your lives and experiences. We're now going to move on to a Q&A with questions submitted by young people. And I'm just going to 
put some questions out there and if you like to jump on, turn your mic on, that would be amazing. Thank you. Um, so the first question that we have is, do you see your LGBT plus identity and your faith as interconnected? Are they two parallel parts of you, side by side? I don't mind jumping in unless someone else wants to go first. Um, I think for a long time, I felt much more that my Jewish identity was the main part of my identity and, and my lesbian identity was just kind of, well, this is just who I happen to be, um, kind of incidental. And I know that that comes from a great privilege of, um, as I say, growing up in the liberal movement and kind of my um, questions and, and the homophobia that came for me was was from actually much more uh, general society and growing up in a time of section 28 where there was no representation no one could talk about um being lgbtq plus at school it was all very hush hush and um for me that's where uh, my questions came from but certainly in terms of um the ability to be jewish and um, a lesbian was never really a question for me um and it wasn't until I moved to London, actually, and suddenly I found myself surrounded by very straight, uh, just a group of very straight, mostly Jewish friends. And I realised that the reason I'd not had to question or, or have that as part of my identity is because just by accident, I'd, I'd surrounded myself with LGBTQ plus people. Um, and I sometimes feel that when you're a minority, um, that your identity can either be pushed back or shine through and certainly for me uh, when I feel like a minority those parts of my identity shine through and I also think that it's worth saying that um, as I said the community that I work in um, I am really standing on the shoulders of giants um, and whether I'm possibly the youngest um, person on this panel um, and my experience um, of living as a lesbian I, I know has has largely due to the hard work and activism of others that came before me and certainly a lot of the women um, and men but but a lot of the women in my community did a lot of fighting and were pushed out of a lot of spaces um, and really paved the way for me to be able to be a rabbi um, to live my life with my partner I'm getting married next month no questions asked under a chuppah um, all things like that that I know has has come from the activism of others and I think realizing that um, has certainly made it so that my obligation as, as a, a Jew to be an activist we're called upon to uh, it's not our job to complete the work but it is our job to start it and to be part of it and I certainly see the work of LGBTQ plus inclusion as part of that mission um, of my Judaism. I wonder if I could come in at that point. I mean, gosh, thank you, Anna. It's sort of terrific stuff. Um, in terms of, of being trans and being a Christian, there is a deep integration for me. And part of that comes from a phrase which is really precious to me, which is a deep part of the the spiritual traditions in which I've been formed. And the phrase is this, that, that in, in Christ we are called to become who we are. Called to become who we are. And that idea of movement towards that which you are already has these incredible resonances for me in terms of my journey of faith and my journey as a trans person. That like so many trans people, I knew, uh, God, I was a dot, you know, I was just a tiny little dot. And I, I knew that, that something was different about me and that in terms of, of who I'd been assigned to be, that wasn't me. I knew that in my very bones, in my very DNA, but I had to become who I am. It, it did involve shifts, social shifts and legal shifts for me. You know, that's a, a really important part of my journey as it has been for a lot of older trans people, although I appreciate a lot of younger trans people see things differently now. But equally in that journey of faith to, to discover a kind of unfolding 
of reality, an invitation to walk into God and therefore change, but then discovering in that, in, in coming to faith as I did at 26, to realize that, oh gosh, I'd actually been baptized when I was three months. And so I became a Christian, but I'd been a Christian. So this, this profound journeying stuff, which so many trans people, you know, when, 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 whenever, whenever we're challenged to say, oh, you know, how can you be Christian? How can you be people of faith? Well, it's how could we not in a sense? Because we were told from the earliest days, you are not who you are. And we've had to be children of resistance and become adults of, of, of faith and, and, and to trust that inner story, that truth that we knew from so long ago, from our earliest days. That is such a beautiful sentiment, Rachel. Thank you so much for that, and to you, Anna. Ruby, I wonder if you could maybe have a go at this one for us. Um, it's, what do you wish people knew about being an LGBT plus person who's also a person of faith? Sorry, I didn't catch that last, but who's also? Who's also a person of faith. Oh, person of faith, okay. Um, I think um, just following on um, from what Rachel said, um, uh, it, there is a sense of how can you possibly be both? You've got to be one or the other. Uh, and for me, they are so naturally the same for me. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess having grown up in the kind of environment I did, which was pretty much traveling all the time, uh, and being a person who came to this country uh, as an outsider. I'm an Indian, by the way, I, I'm still an Indian. So I'm slightly out of the, you know, uh, the sense of you are British and therefore you're X, Y, and Z. So I've always been on the outside, on the periphery, looking in on situations and thinking, well, why are people so confused or worked up about these things? Because having lived in different communities and different ways of expressing yourself and being and understanding and respecting that, uh, I find it really odd that people could get themselves so worked up, particularly about faith. And I'm thinking, but why? Show me in the Bible where it specifically targets you as a person who's LGBTIQA and any of the other things that, you know, we're categorized into. I can show you a hundred, hundreds of examples where we're loved, we're embraced, and we're accepted by God and God's love. Um, and so I think people, maybe it's just a default we have in us, and, you know, in terms of latching onto the negative, uh, the hurt and the pain that we see in the news, uh, you know, so we l latch onto that, or if someone says something derogatory, and when you're having a coffee, you hang on to that. You may hang on to someone saying something nice and laugh about it and joke, and then you forget it, but you somehow seem to hang on to things that are horrible and painful, maybe because you don't experience that much in your life. So it's something you hang on to. So if we're being hit over the head by, you know, a text in the Bible, and I can only think about three or four that are there, the rest are just amazing. Well, why do people hang on to the three or four? That's because it's it's a powerful tool to use against someone, you know, a group of people. And that's, that's constantly what we're being battered against. I refuse to hear that. I acknowledge it happens, but I refuse to allow other people's anger and judgments of me to affect my life. The challenge is for me to support people who are affected by it. And, and surely that's what we all try to do. If we love something enough and we identify with it, we then want to make other people be able to see that and enjoy it and be affirmed by it. Uh, so for me, I, I, I personally, have never had issues about faith and sexuality. They've been a kind of seamless journey for me, uh, and I'm blessed by that. But I know I represent and work with so many people who are not, who are really damaged, hurt, and in a very pained place. Well, it's so lovely to hear that you can get so much joy from your faith as an LGBT plus person. I think that's such a lovely thing to hear about, to hear you all say. And Ludwig, I was wondering if you could come in here and maybe tell us 
what your favorite thing about your faith is? Yes, yes. Thank you all for those uh, contributions. That so I I. I I also had like a period where I was um, where it was very difficult just to imagine that you could be gay and, and Muslim at the same time. That was in Nigeria, it was civil war, it was violence everywhere and inside my family also. Physically and 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 emotionally and, and spiritually also. I was torn apart between two parts of myself, like trying to choose uh, between one or the other. And when I was there, I lived only my spirituality, but that was that was a privilege to be able to acquire that knowledge that is helping me to empower myself, uh, myself and, and try to help others or contribute modestly to other people's uh, liberation nowadays. But it was very hard. I was living only my spirituality. And then when we left Algeria, I, I came to, to France and, and here I studied social sciences, psychology. I read other books about spirituality, about other prophets, uh, stories in other traditions. Uh, I tried other uh, mystical techniques, uh, meditation uh, with Buddhist monks and so on. So uh, or praying in, in, in churches with uh, uh, queer Christian organizations before we founded our, ours like 10, 15 years ago. So, um, but it was still very hard because I was more or less living for a few years when I, I arrived in Europe, only my sexuality. Also because the only representation I had of, 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 of religion of Islam per se was, was very fascistic, was very political, patriarchal, you know, man, power to man and 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 all the others are subalterns have to obey and and homosexuality was not a word that i knew when i was there i discovered this term when i came here and and the only representation i had of the you know the gay identity was also very on the other side very anti-religious because many people told me at that time like 15 20 years ago that uh, religion is the main source of, of discrimination against LGBT plus individuals. And, and then, of course, I discovered after a few years of, of research and studies and that, that you can find homophobia, transphobia, unfortunately, ev everywhere that it, it is, uh, unfortunately, especially in a time of crisis, when people are feeling endangered they start discriminating minorities, ethnical, religious, uh, um, um, and, and gender minorities. So um, my studies, that was a, maybe the, the, the biggest privilege in my, in my life to be able to study. And, and it took me <laughs> 20 years to, to finish my studies, almost at 40 years old. But, you know, you're never old to... Uh, to to learn, and I'm still learning a lot uh, anthropologically. I mean, on 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 a grassroots level, with the people that we we welcome here, they're teaching us so much about the reality. Because there's so many people telling you you could not be like this and like that at the same time, but unfortunately for them, they're wrong because we do exist. And and uh, as uh, Rabbi Anna said. Uh, in the beginning of this uh, um, round of answers, uh, yeah, we 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 are here to start the job, and and I'm I'm really really very very happy to be able to contribute um, to to spread that kind of you know uh, ideas and and representations of who we are, who we can be to the next generation. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Thank you so much. And as you were mentioning a little bit about the task, perhaps, of um, encouraging inclusivity, I wanted to ask anyone who likes to jump in on this, um, how can places of worship and faith communities be more inclusive to LGBT plus people? How can we make those changes and what would they look like? I think I can speak to, to that, Hannah, a little. Uh, Part of the work is about being bold. Uh, so what do I mean by that? 
it's no good in this day and age a, a church or um you know i i, I guess a, a mosque or or uh, a synagogue or gurdwara simply saying the words you are welcome that's that's actually not going to be good enough because everybody says that so actually what needs to be said is what that means so the church in which i've been the the leader for the last 13 years and the wider community the deanery of which i've been part in that time we we worked really hard it took a lot of hard work and sometimes some disagreement to become part of what's called the inclusive church network and what that means is that every single one of the churches in the area where I'm, I'm currently dean, that's 12 churches, has permission to put up a sign that says, we welcome you to this church and then give an account of what that means. And we welcome and celebrate you regardless of your sexuality, your gender, ident your, your gender identity, your economic power and background. Uh, whether you're, you're, you're a woman or non-binary. And, and, and this, this has to be put out there, not to say, now we've arrived, but now we've begun. Because what it means at a place like St. Nick's that, that I'm just leaving is that when somebody comes in across our threshold, who might be queer, and they have a bad experience, and that could happen, they actually now have permission to come up to the leadership team and say, you said this, why, why has this happened? And we have a duty and responsibility to actually not just listen, but act on that and say, you're right, we're gonna do some more work and, and we're gonna take responsibility for that. It is hard, but I think that's that's got to be a starting point. And it's also, you know, fi finally, sorry, you can tell I get really passionate about this. It's it's not hiding from the fact that we are all human beings who, by the time that we are adults, usually have a very clear idea about who we are in terms of our sexuality and our gender identity and not pretending that that's something we can't talk about. Churches particularly for too long have been scared of bodies. I've been scared of the fact that we are in this world and we are actually living, breathing human beings. And, and we can't just talk about abstracts like love and justice without talking about what that means for actual people, because otherwise it costs lives, Hannah. And this is you know, a very serious point, this. Our neighborhood church became an inclusive church in part because one of their young people, um, and a sort of content warning here, one of their young people took their life because they felt they couldn't talk about being a lesbian in that church. We have to be able to talk about who we are and what we're feeling if we don't it costs lives. And I want to echo in some, if that's okay, what Rachel said, I think it's all, and this is partly what my rabbinic dissertation was about. It's all well and good us sitting around and saying, oh, look at us, we're so inclusive. But if those messages aren't out there, whether it's LGBTQ plus inclusion, when we're talking about institutionalized racism, you know, gender um, on the spectrum and, and, and also, you know, in, in synagogues, in some synagogues, there's a gender divide between men and women. And so how do we break down those barriers of assumptions? We can't just all assume that everyone knows um, that they're welcome in our space. And I think that um, can Rachel really hit the nail on the head. It's not just because um, we want to welcome people and broaden the community, but it, it's more serious than that. It's a deeper message than that. This is really life and death and it's about protecting young people and and certainly in the different denominations of Judaism um, a lot of work's being done to and and with the different denominations to move 
um, each dom denomination as far as they can move at this stage on inclusion. And, and that's all um, in relation to um, the interaction with the text and, and these kind of three difficult texts that um, Ruby talked about it and, and the laws that come out of those. But um, it's an issue of pukuach nefesh, that means sanctity of life. Um, and this idea that we're all made in, in the image of God before there were religions or nations or everybody was made in the image of God. And that means that everybody has a holiness within them, um, whoever they are. And it's about working with that and, and letting people know that they're included. And last night, I have to say, I was in, um, we, we, it's, it's the festival of Shavuot, um, which is when the Ten Commandments were given to um, the Israelite people at, uh, on, on Mount Sinai, and you stay up all night studying. So if I'm a little bit incoherent, that's why. And um, we just had this incredible community last night across genders, across sexuality, across uh, generation and we grappled with pieces of text with all of those identities coming into the text and um one of my favorite rabbis rabbi benay le pay um set up a queer talmud camp um in the states and she says that um, if a donkey were to read um the torah then they would see all the donkey stories in torah and we had a session last night about reading our own identities into the book of ruth which is the um the one of the books we read um, during the, the time of Shavuot. And it was incredible hearing what, what um, our spectrum of identity read into the text. And I, I felt like it was such a celebratory space that we could have those conversations. Can I just jump in there as well? I, I think, um, yeah, please. <laughs> you know, really what Rachel has said and, and, and you said as well, um, uh, it's just so, um, so pertinent and to the point, uh, you know, that in order to be a welcoming ch a church, mosque, uh, you know, a temple, whatever our faith is, it's really about reflecting the society that exists. Um, and if they're not in your place of worship, then there's a problem. There really is, because now you've become this elitist, exclusive uh, organization where you you don't fit into the mold of what we expect you to be well no one fits into the mold they are created uniquely to be who they are who god made them to be and so it's really important to acknowledge and recognize that um uh, just recently um uh, congregation for the doctrine of faith came out with this ridiculous thing called a response and which said no we will not give same-sex blessings well you know the catholic church <laughs> you know with its factions were up in arms you know the left wing and the right wing were fighting and arguing it but what was wonderful is that the bishops have come out and said yes we will give same-sex lessons you cannot tell us what to do the church the institution has refused to recognize marriages for same-sex people they're in loving committed relationships and if we want to give them a blessing we will we give blessings to inanimate objects, so why can't we to people who are committed loving relationships, for God's sake? And this bishop, uh, Bishop Bonnie from uh, Belgium, wonderful gentleman, was talking about how in his diocese, 5,000 people in one week left the church. They unsubscribed. Now, these weren't LGBT people. These were straight people who were so sick and tired of what the church was doing to the minority. That's amazing. That's wonderful kind of reaction, but it's a loss to the church, it hemorrhages. And the other important thing he said was that in any church, and I'm sure it's true of any mosque or synagogue or whatever, that there is a group of people there, and if you break it down, they are minorities. Okay, and those minorities, they may not be very open, but they may be uh, divorcees, they may be, uh, you know, single parents. Uh, they may be sex workers, they may be drug addicts, they may be LGBT, but they're all minorities who make up the majority. So really, as a minority, we have to say we are part of the community. We belong there. And as Pope Francis is always saying, bring the smell of the sheep into the church. The church is the shepherd, we are the sheep. So bring it in. And I think it's so important that, that that's what we do. You know, we go in and say, okay, we don't fit the model or the mode of what you say a perfect individual is. We don't care. We are God's creatures and we're here. And we demand our place at the table. 
And I think we just need to be empowered by that authority that we're given by our faith leaders, by our, you know, by the texts in our, in our, in our holy books and go in and say, here I am. Thank you very much. Where's my seat? You know? Oh, it's so wonderful to hear about these huge acts of solidarity as well by church members. But I wonder, perhaps Ludovic, if you could tell us um, sort of more day to day, what advice you'd give for a young person to be a good ally to a peer who is both LGBT plus and a person of faith? Uh, yes, thank you. I would, I would first recall that um, being inclusive for a spiritual community or, or a person who's got uh, faith in, in, in God, whatever name we give to that absolute, to that beautiful entity that we call God, um, is supposed to be the basis of our traditions because a, a tradition that is not inclusive, including everyone, that is exclusive, that is asking you to exclude everyone that is not exactly like you, or disagree with you on some some issues, that's not a tradition that would have survived for centuries, for millenniums sometimes. So that is what we call in Arabic Tawheed, meaning the unicity of God for all humanity, no matter the tradition, the, the representation, the idea that we have of God, we all worshiping the same essence and we all believe in our traditions that we are sparkles of God's light on earth. And, and being inclusive is, is uh, supposed to be theoretically mandatory in, in, in Islam. And in 2009, 2010, we founded uh, a queer Muslim, LGBT Muslim organization uh, to welcome people who were more and more targeted by extremists in, in Europe and elsewhere, both sides, racist people one side and homophobic, transphobic uh, people the other side. And we were caught between the Emma and the Anvil uh, at that time. So we decided together and to help one another and so on, to support one another. And then after a few years, and that was kind of a little miracle for, for, for me, I saw it like this, um, more and more uh, straight people came to us and told us, what you say about uh, spirituality and Islam and being part of, of and all live together, no matter our ethnical or religious backgrounds, does make very much sense to us, but we are not queer. So what do we do? <laughs> and that's how we had the idea of, of like it happened in South Africa, uh, South Africa, yes, and, and North America at that time, we decided to create an inclusive gathering space to share food, to laugh together and to pray also sometimes together. And we called that just like they did before, the generation before us elsewhere, we called it an inclusive mosque. And we really thought, I thought personally, yeah, that nobody would be interested in that because it's who prays nowadays, you know? <laughs> so I was like, no, ah, we're just gonna do it like this, be, uh, praying and, and gathering once a week at least, and, and, and we're gonna have peace because nobody's gonna be interested in that. And it was a big buzz because people were like, oh, how is it possible now we had, uh, we had a few years ago like queer organization, Muslim organizations, but now they're touching to the mosque, but the mosque is supposed to be sacred. And we said, yeah, but your mosque, when we go to, to a mainstream mosque, most of the time, if you're queer, if you get out of the mold, of, of, of the norm, as they say, um, some people do not feel welcome. So this is a problem that we're trying to deal with because you didn't do it for whatever reason. And, and maybe that diversity is a good thing. Not everybody's gonna come to our mosque, but the idea is that we spread the message once again, that it is possible to be and spiritual at the same time. And as I said, more and more straight people came to, to us and it became the majority of the community. Uh, in Paris and also at the Institute here in Marseille, where um, that message of universal love has been revived from within our tradition through minorities. First, 
and then it touched and uh, it spoke to the majority of our society of our communities and i think that it is very beautiful to 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 think about the fact that um, um maybe there is a lot of suffering and violence and discrimination when you are you know growing up knowing that you are uh, queer and spiritual at the same time but with patience and affirmation it it becomes better with years of of self empowerment and 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 dialogue with other people who disagree with you because there's there's a, a something special about being part of a double minority like an ethnical religious and and queer minority you understand the message of universal love maybe not differently but maybe more powerfully and, and maybe that's why we are uh, uh, we have been created the way we are to to and and reinforce this message of universal love and and to create something positive out of something that might seems to be especially when you're a teenager something that is negative Yeah, I think that's such a wonderful affirmation, Vivek. Thank you. I actually wanted to ask a slightly more practical question, perhaps to Rabbi Anna, and say, um, what advice would you give to a young Jewish person, perhaps, who is trying to work out their sexual or gender identity? What concrete things might you say to them, or places would you direct them? So, firstly, I, I'd say that you can be all of you. You know, this is an idea that you're created in God's image and God doesn't make mistakes in creation and there is a holiness in who you are. Um, I also, in terms of very practical advice of, of where to go and, and who to look to, um, I'd recommend contacting your local synagogue if you're worried about, um, I, I think it wouldn't be unsafe to say contact um, any synagogue near you, but um, maybe if you're worried, I'd, I'd contact your local progressive synagogue or the, the liberal reform or, or Mazorti movement. Um, that's not to exclude the other movements, it's just I, I can say from my experience that that will be a safe place to go. Um, there's also the JW3, um, which is a, a, a Jewish cultural centre in London, but a lot of their things are online, have a queer cafe. Um, there is an organisation called Keshet UK, who are similar in some ways to Just Like Us, but they do work within the Jewish community and in Jewish schools. Um, there's BKY, Beit Klal Yisrael, the community I'm at. Um, uh, yeah, I'd say reach out, reach out to your local community, to your local rabbi. Feel free to to reach out to me. You've got my name. You can you can search for me online, and just know that you can be your whole self. You can be Jewish. You can live a fulfilling um, religious, if that's your your way, or cultural Jewish life and have your full um, LGBTQ identity as well. And there are spaces for you. And if that's a struggle for you within your current community or within your family, there are places that can help you through that struggle as well. And there are resources out there for you. Thank you so much, Anna. That's going to be really helpful, I'm sure. Um, Ruby, do you have anything to add to that in the Catholic context? I know you're part of Rainbow Catholics, which uh, perhaps young people could use that you think? What would you suggest for a young person? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, uh, I think uh, we, we, when we talk about youth, we're really looking at, uh, because it's uh, the rain, uh, global network of rainbow Catholics is global, so the laws and legislation are different, different parts of the world, so we've kind of said, you know, uh, 18 plus, uh, uh, we can kind of uh, uh, support and, and, um, and uh, engage with. Um, um, the national group in, in England, Quest, also have that same 18-year uh, bench point. But I would say on a practical level, really, if, if you are identify as being gay, lesbian, trans, whatever, um, and you're in a school or in a college, well, first place to go to is go and talk to your tutor. Uh, you know, and if your college or institution doesn't have an LGBT group, start one for goodness sake. You know, start a WhatsApp group. Start something yourself. Identify with people who you know or you think are like you. 
start having those conversations and make it grow, you know. Um, uh, but I mean, there's a group called, I think it's called the, the, the Proud Trust, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, LGBT group, uh, yeah, the proudtrust.org, uh, who deal with young, young uh, LGBT uh, people. You know, uh, they can support you if, if they're not looking at faith particularly, but in terms of education, so, uh, social contacts, they can put you in touch with groups uh, close to where you are. Uh, but in terms of faith, I think, you know, there isn't, as far as I know, uh, in, I just mentioned some, but in terms of Catholic groups, I don't think there are any uh, uh, that have been set up for young people. So maybe if you're so inclined, why don't you start one? That would be a great thing to do. You know, uh, um, and that's certainly how Quest started. It started, you know, 45 years ago, or 47 years ago, by somebody putting a little ad in the Evening Standard Young people, you won't know what that is. It was a, it was an evening newspaper, and they put a little ad in, there and it was a PO box, post office box. So you know, it took ages for people to write in, and the letters to be sent, and then you know, uh, a month later, twenty young men got together who didn't know each other from Adam, but they got together and said, "Yeah, I'm gay and I'm Catholic, and I'd like to figure out how I can get these two things to reconcile." And that became the organization that it is now, 47 years later. So who knows, you know, you could start something yourselves, you know, as, as young Catholic, Jewish, Anglican, Muslim, there were Hindus, whatever, you know, start something yourself for young people. That'd be a great thing. Oh, that's such a lovely story. Um, Rich, I was wondering if you had an answer to the same question about if a young Christian came to you and they were questioning their gender or sexuality, what practical advice would you give them? Thank you. I do apologize, Hannah. I dropped out of the conversation there briefly. Um, I mean, firstly, I just want to echo Ruby's boldness uh, about starting a group. I think, gosh, that's amazing. Um, I do commend uh, the Proud Trust. We had the great good fortune of having some members of our congregation who worked for them for a while, and they are very good around faith, uh, and young people and exploring identities. Um, I think the first thing to say is, is don't let anyone tell you you are not who you say you are. I mean, I just want to say, you know, you are beloved by God as you are discovering who you are and as who you find it, who you found yourself to be. And please don't let anyone try and put uh, um, just even a modicum of doubt in your your mind. Yes, you may want space to explore the, to who you are, but gosh, the, the time has come for us simply to celebrate who we are in the community. So I just I want that young person to be celebrated. In terms of uh, wider support groups within the Christian community, the Church of England, and what we might call the the Protestant communities. I'm a patron of a group called Open Table Network. They are terrific in terms of offering space and opportunities to worship God together fully as an LGBTQIA plus person. Um, search those them out. Diverse Church was set up precisely for younger LGBT plus Christians to to explore who they are. Um, in terms of finding a faith community, uh, go on the net and look at Inclusive Church or One Body, One Faith. Um, one thing that is is true, certainly from the the kind of non-Catholic Christian side of things, non-Roman Catholic uh, Christian side of things, is that people got really organised quite a while back. Back in, uh, and I quest are clearly, you know, a very organized, very well respected group, but that, that there are those groups that have existed in the Church of England as well since the 70s. But it's become very clear that we had to find some new energy. And so there are lots and lots of groups out there to support young LGBT Christians. But firstly, I just want, I, I would want to say to that person, know that you are made in the image of God and you are called into the likeness of Christ, and God delights in you. God delights in you.
That's such wonderful advice. Thank you, Rachel. And I think it's just lovely advice for all young LGBT plus people to say that, you know, we know ourselves best. So just like trust in yourself and how you're identifying. Um, Ludovic, I was wondering if you had any advice for a young Muslim who came to you questioning their sexuality agenda. Yes, um, uh, the, the, the question they ask me generally all the time, every time I have a, a, a young queer Muslim uh, contacting me or being part of our dynamics meetings and so on is about the scriptures, the Islamic scriptures. I have to say that in In the Quran, there's absolutely nothing against homosexuality or trans identity. Um, uh, this word homosexuality is not quoted even once in the Quran, never. So they tell you about, you know, they would tell you, they will continue to tell you about Sodom and Gomorrah, Qom Lut, uh, the people of, of the prophet Lut, uh, peace be upon him. But those people are clearly described in more than 70 verses in the Quran as being violent physically and, and spiritually, and they were violating people's dignity, men, women, uh, strangers passing by nearby the city. So that has nothing to do with uh, same-sex uh, uh, love or with trans identity. And then I was I was uh, uh, very much surprised at around 30 years old uh, when I got back to those scriptures and the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I discovered so many traditions, a hadith telling us about the fact that uh, uh, the Prophet was, uh, according to this tradition, welcoming in his home what we call Muhammadun Mustarjilat, so queer people who were uh, violated, uh, oppressed violently by other people who were, as we would say nowadays, homophobic, transphobic. He was welcoming them in his home amongst his children uh, and wives. So clearly what we found in our tradition, when we look with higher scrutiny at those texts, we find more inclusivity and tolerance and peace than what we would uh, expect when we grow up in, in, in uh, our community. So I would advise not to, to be shy or to be afraid to confront those traditions because there's much more freedom and empowerment that uh, we can imagine. And uh, as uh, uh, our sister Ruby said, I would advise also uh, young queer Muslims not to stay alone and uh, to meet up uh, virtually or physically with uh, other people coming from the same background and asking themselves the same questions because together we are stronger, of course. And, and loneliness is our best enemy in front of discrimination and, and, and violence, especially when it's coming from within our families and communities. Uh, we cherish those links, but sometimes those relationships become, they become toxic and, and violent because we could not affirm ourselves and we integrate, we internalize those uh, uh, negative representations of ourselves. So we have to meet up with uh, uh, people who are going through the same uh, struggles to free themselves from those prejudices. Absolutely. Thank you, Ludovic. I think finding community has definitely been an overarching theme in terms of the advice. Um, we're running a little bit low on time, but I was wondering if we could just go for one last question. If you could all tell me um, one thing that you'd say to yourself as one thing that you'd say to yourself when you're in school, if you could go back and talk to yourself in school, one affirmation that you'd give yourself. Um, Anna, would you like to go first? Um, uh, gosh, I think if, you know, there's, there was the whole, it gets better, um, campaign, but I think I, it's going to be okay and, and ride with it because it's, it's a journey. All of it's a journey, right? Childhood's a journey, adolescence, a journey, adulthood's a journey, and you're figuring it all out as, as you go on. And, um, I like what Rachel Cannon says, like, let, don't let anybody question who you are and everything you're thinking right now doesn't have to be everything you're thinking next 
week in the next hour but just roll with it and and believe in yourself and there's community out there for you and um yeah it's it's going to be okay that's so nice thank you anna um rachel what about you what you say? i'd said to young rachel i think rabbi anna's pretty much said it all um i, I think if I wanted to add something, it's to say, be prepared for adventure. I know that sounds rather dramatic and over the top, but it's not only that it's going to get better, uh, and that there are, uh, but also there's going to be some some pretty rough moments as well. But that the world is going to open up. And things that we could not possibly have imagined happening will happen. I cannot tell you, Hannah, uh, uh, the, uh, how much the world has changed. When I left school at 18 to go to uni, we were still living under Section 28. Um, and for the young people, you know, Google it. And, and to... To be able to say that between 1988 and 2004, there would be this transformation in UK society. I could not have imagined it at 18. And, and heck, we're going to find some tough days to come, of course. But you know, it's that whole thing about, about the, you know, the, the arc of history is long, but it curves towards justice. And, and it's curving in that direction. So to my 18 year old self, my 16 year old self to say, it could get pretty hairy out there, but this adventure is gonna blow your mind and you're gonna love it. That is such a nice thank you. And so hopeful. Um, Ruby, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think your mic might be off, Ruby. Sorry, I didn't hear. Okay. Um, what can I say? Uh, wow. Uh, I want to be you, Rachel, <laughs> back in school. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Um, okay. I think one of the things when I used to do a lot of teaching was, you know, I'd do my little spiel and then I'd say, okay, anyone got a question? And they'd all sit there really quietly. And I'd say, listen, be the brave one. Be the one who puts their hand up to ask a question, because I can guarantee you there's 20 other students in the class also wanting to ask that question, but being too afraid. So do not be afraid. Stand up, put your hand up and say who you are, and you will find people coming who are just like you. You will not be alone. So don't go through life on your own. Get that group of friends together who are just like you, who are going to go through this amazing journey that Rachel's described. Do it together. Do it for each other. Do it for yourself. And it will be wonderful because you're setting the seeds that will make you grow into this amazing individual who gives to society just as much as you demand back from society. It'll be great. So put your hand up. Do it. Oh, that's so lovely. I'm having such an urge to clap these. <laughs> um, Ludwig, would you like to finish this off with a thought that you'd like to have known when you were a kid? Uh, yeah, I would I would tell myself what it is uh, quoted in the Quran, yusra. After struggles come comfort and peace. So I would just calm down myself or try to <laughs> i have to say i loved my teenagehood despite the the harsh context uh, around me and, and finding refuge in france and that adapting to totally new culture i have to say it, it was a wonderful period of my life because i discovered so many new things and i um yeah i think i i, I always had in me that idea that yeah it's going to be fine in a way or another because life is is so much uh, uh, adventures, adventures, uh, as as uh, uh, you said, uh, Rachel, uh, and and 
yeah that's very exciting that's uh you have to take it like this i think as a uh, something that is very exciting there's some some dark spots along the way but it, it never lasts forever so yeah thank you it is exciting and it's a lot of exciting thank you so much um that brings us to the end of today's last class i want to thank our brilliant guests for that amazing and informative and inspiring panel um, to all of you for watching and to just like us for organizing these masterclasses as a part of their school diversity week 2021 you can find out more about school diversity week on the just like us website which is www.justlikeus.org or on Facebook at Just Like Us, or on Instagram or Twitter, which are both at Just Like Us UK. If you'd like to hear more from this amazing speakers we've had on today, you can find all of them on Twitter. Ruby Almeida's Twitter is at Poonchidi, which is P-O-O-N-C-H-I-D-I. -I. Rabbi Anna Posner's is Posner underscore Anna. Dr. Ludovic Mohammed Zahid is, Zahid is at Ludovic Mohammed Z. <laughs> And Canon Rachel Manns is at Rev Rachel Mann with two ends. I'd like to just remind you all again that it's really important to stay safe online this week. And if you need some more information on how to do this, just take a look at the comments of this video. Um, thank you once more to our fantastic guests for such an interesting masterclass.